President Buhari's letter responding to the Electoral Act Amendment Bill is finally before federal lawmakers in both chambers of the National Assembly on Tuesday. The 30-day deadline for President Buhari to communicate to the National Assembly on his decision to either sign or decline assent on the Electoral Act Amendment Bill expired on Sunday, December the 19th. In the Senate, lawmakers converge in groups. They already knew the content of a letter. Senate President Ahmad Lawan gets down to business and reads the communication to his colleagues, disclosing President Buhari's decision, refusing to sign the Electoral Act Amendment Bill into law and the reasons given. The conduct of direct primaries across the 8,809 wars across the length and breadth of the country will lead to a significant spike in the course of conducting primary elections by parties as well as increase in the cost of monitoring such elections by INEC, in addition to increased costs identified above, conducting and monitoring primary elections across 8,809 wars will pose huge security challenges as the security agencies will also be overstretched and such large turnout without effective security coordination will also engender intimidation and disruptions thereby raising credibility issues for the outcomes of such elections. Done with reading the correspondence from the president, the Senate proceeds to other matters. But a federal legislator draws his colleagues back to President Buhari's letter. Mr. President, it's my opinion that the Senate dissolved into a closed session and discuss on it whether we can take appropriate decision on it. A closed-door session commences. More than 30 minutes later, proceedings are open to the public. Lawmakers are seen still holding intimate discussions in groups and writing on a piece of paper. Sources say these are signatures from legislators showing the intention to override President Buhari's veto on the Electoral Act Amendment Bill. However, the Senate President makes no mention of what transpired during the executive session and adjourns plenary till the following day, going against the upper chamber's earlier plan of proceeding on its end-of-year holiday on Tuesday. In the House of Representatives, the Speaker also reads the letter from President Buhari declining assent to the Electoral Act Amendment Bill. As it is now, that bill has not, been, has not received presidential assent. And it falls to Parliament to decide the best way forward. As plenary progresses, a member raises a matter of privilege, urging the Speaker to guide the House on how to respond to President Buhari's letter. The word now in the street is that this is a do-nothing House. You've read the President's correspondence. We need to have a direction. The minority leader also raises a matter of privilege to immediately address the matter. So, Mr. Speaker, I'm begging this House that we can suspend our rules and immediately look at that clause that talks about direct primaries. The House of Representatives proceeds on its end-of-year holiday, and whatever response it intends to make as regards President Buhari's decision on the Electoral Act Amendment Bill will be clearer when it resumes in January 2022. Linda Akibi, Channels Television News. It seems, well, the political class, maybe here and there, depending on which side of the divide you choose. The legal, well, judicial, well, ju the judicial segment, also maybe depending on which side of the, of the divide you are, but the ones whose voices we've heard have said, no, no. The CSOs definitely want it signed immediately. Well, the president has spoken. What is his spokesman got to say? Well, um, that conversation will happen in Abuja. Malpe, good morning. Good morning, Ayo. Indeed, we're joined here by Mr. Femi Adishino, who's special advisor to the president on media and publicity. You're welcome to Sunrise Elite this morning. Thank you. Good morning. 
Well, you did say the last time you were here that there was no need to hurry, that uh, whatever uh, was hidden will certainly come to light and that a pregnant woman doesn't have room to hide. <laughs> so we, we've seen finally what has been delivered um, of this pregnant woman and it looks like it hasn't gone down well uh, with you know, a host of people. First and foremost, they wonder why it took so long for the president to reach his decision. Yeah, thank you. Uh, on why it took so long, it's already answered in that communication the president sent to the National Assembly. He said he had to buy opinions from diverse groups, informed opinions from MDAs, from different interest groups, stakeholders within and outside government. So it's, uh, it's something that will naturally take time. And then why it took so long there is a window of 30 days for the president to do that and he did it just within that time why was this shrouded in so much secrecy though the president's final decision because it was really difficult to eventually know which way the pendulum had swung uh reaching out to the spokespersons including yourself <laughs> didn't yield much fruit but it eventually leaked that the president uh, well, had not put pen or yes, had re withheld assent on this particular bill. Yes, um, you know that at times babble of voices cause confusion, and this was a very, very important uh, piece of legislation, and you needed all the concentration you could get to take the best decision for the country. So. Um, the, 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 the least the president would need during that time was a babble of voices that would confuse him. He was buying opinions from stakeholders, and he needed to be able to design the, the, the opinions they have given him and in, arrive at an informed position. The president has always spoken about his desire to leave a legacy of free and fair elections but every time the electoral act has reached his table there's been one excuse or another why the president has refused to put pen to paper uh, do you think that he himself has sufficiently engaged with lawmakers on the sort of bill that he would like to you know see passed into law in terms of an electoral act which he believes will be able to give nigerians uh, you know the kind of legacy which he intends to leave with regards to elections yeah, the fact that he refused to assent uh, to those species of legislation could also mean that he believed it was the best way to live a free and fair process. Because uh, signing th th those laws may end up injuring our democratic process. And he said so in that letter, that it was anti-democratic. It would be anti-democratic to sign it. So, what was anti-democratic about the bills passed, which we saw that was very contentious between the houses, nearly causing a division, a, a, a bill which saw the Senate reverse itself, uh, you know, to grant, it will seem, the desire of Nigerians, that's what they believe they've done, um, uh, uh, before it eventually went to the president's table. What was um, anti-democratic about it? Oh, well, the president said particularly on direct primaries, that uh, uh, it was contrary to free will, freedom of expression, which is very important in a democracy. So, all the reasons, economic, political, legal, security, have been advanced in that communication. Who is free will, if we may ask? Democracy is about the people. It's about the largest number of people. If you have a small clique wanting something and that thing was not going to be in the interest of the larger majority, of course, a Democrat like the president will then go for the interest of the larger majority. Okay, so there have been talks about, I don't know whether you've seen uh, the different reactions that have come up as a result of uh, the president's non-assent. There are those who believe that this is just an attempt to pull a wool over the eyes of Nigerians, that the real bone of contention, it's not the direct primaries as we have been made to believe, uh, but the transmission of results, which was one of the things that tore the House um, of Representatives and even the Senate 
uh, you know, we saw how contentious that was um, in the National Assembly, that that is the real reason, that that is going to hurt the chances of the APC in the 2023 elections, and they believe that that's why the president hasn't put pen to paper. That, that, would, that would just be a matter of conjecture, because in that communication, read it line by line, word for word, you didn't see anything about electro, uh, uh, electronic transmission of results. Not a single word, not a sentence on that in that communication. So it will only be the conjecture of certain people. The president didn't say that was any reason why he didn't sign. Rather, it was anchored on the mood of primaries. Well, talking about the president's engagement, uh, the letter did speak of engaging with MDAs. I'm trying to see if I can get yes. the letter itself now. It says, um, the right honorable speaker may wish to note that the nomination of party candidates solely via direct primaries as envisaged by the Electoral Act Amendment Bill 2021 has serious adverse legal, financial, economic, and security consequences which cannot be accommodated at the moment, considering our nation's peculiarities. Uh, first, I'd like to know what precisely, what are some of the serious, adverse, legal, financial, and economic and security consequences which the president is talking about? They, they, they were also explained. Talking of legal first, he said that there will be the uh, chances of series of litigations arising after direct primaries to elect candidates. And if you have that plethora of uh, legal cases, it will distract from the process. And then he talked about economic, the cost to the parties, the cost to INEC itself. There are over 8,890 something words, about 9,000 words. INEC will have to monitor direct primaries in each of those words. The parties will have to fund direct primaries in each of those words. The president said the cost was going to be too humongous, not only for government, but also for the political parties. And it will be undemocratic in, in the sense that only the big parties will then be able to do anything. The smaller ones are immediately holding the shorter end of the stick. And for multi-party democracy, that will not be good. Well, he did say that he had received, <coughs> excuse me, informed advice from relevant ministries, departments, and agencies of the government. But for a number of people, they believe that the most relevant of all of the um, parastatals of government, uh, which needed consultation with, was INEC. And we understood that the president did write to INEC. Sure. We understand also that INEC wrote back to the president to say that they were okay with the um, Electoral Act as passed by the National Assembly, and it was, they were good to go. Well, unless you are privy to the content of uh, INEC's communication with the president, as far as I'm concerned, that is not in the public domain. I'm not saying that that was not what they wrote, but we need to be sure. We need to see that communication. You are which the president's I, spokesperson. We, which I'm sure you have not seen. You are and the president's <laughs> spokesperson. I mean, if we, if at the end of the day, the communication to the National Assembly was out even before it was read on the floor of the National Assembly, then we can take it for granted that what we saw in the media uh, about the communication with INEC we can take it to the bank. No, let, let, let's learn not to take anything for granted. Because it depends on uh, who, who is uh, beating the drum on a, a particular issue. Well, whoever is beating the drum knows how to manipulate the, 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 the psyche of the public using the media. So don't take anything for granted until you see in cold print that this is what I neck wrote. I, I do not say that's not what I, I neck wrote, but when we see it, we are then sure. Well, that's so far, uh, in the media's engagement, at least we've had, also, we've had calls also to speak with INEC. We've had calls to ask them questions as to what their reservations will be about the bill as it was passed. They haven't quite expressed any. Okay. So if that is the situation, we have to ask which it, other it, ministries, departments it, it, no, and agencies no, no. Even was if the INEC president didn't taking express on board any, in, take, in reaching this decision? INEC would just be one of the stakeholders. There are many stakeholders in this. 
INEC will just be one of them. So the, the opinion of INEC or the position of INEC will then not be cast in concrete. It will just be one of the opinions and one of the things the president considered. There were many, many more other stakeholders to also uh, consider their opinions. Let's quickly flip this now to Lagos, because I understand my colleague Ayo has questions for you. Thank you, Malque. Uh, well, Mr. Lechino, um, one of the opinions making the rounds, which I'm sure you, well, you may be aware of, is that of uh, the governor of River State, who said, and I quote, Mr. President signed the Petroleum Industry Bill and sent it back for an amendment of the bill. If Mr. President means well for this country, and as he has promised Nigerians that he wants to conduct free and fair elections, then nothing stops Mr. President from assenting to this amendment and then seek an amendment of those clauses that he questioned. What's your take on that? Well, um, the opinion of Governor Wiki would just be one out of the opinions of 36 state governors. You have uh, been scrolling since yesterday the opinion of Governor Samuel Otom of Benue State. If there is a governor that is very critical of the president, is Governor Samuel Otom. But on this one, he's commending the president. So if Governor Wiki has one opinion, well, Governor Otom also has another opinion. And also yesterday on your, your channel here, we saw Governor Coyote fire me who also is supporting the president. Therefore, the opinion of one governor cannot be said to be the opinion. It's just an opinion, and he has a right to it. But then the issue in contention is that the president signed the petroleum industry bill, then sent an amendment with the response. People expect also, a good number of people said the same thing, even some CSOs said the same thing on this program yesterday, that what if the president signed, then appended uh, uh, this, uh, another bill to it, asking for those, those amendments? Well, it's one of the ways it could have been done. But like they say, there are different ways to kill a snake. And the president has chosen to do it this way. It's not the end of the matter. The National Assembly will look at the matter again, and if necessary, they will consult with the president, they will dialogue, but this is not the end of the matter. The matter will still proceed. And one of the opinions in public domain, Mr. Adishina, is that this was an opportunity for the president to put up that legacy, at least initiate the process of that legacy that he promised in our electoral system, that this, not signing it, is a major disappointment on the part of many. No, it depends on who is expressing that opinion of disappointment or otherwise. In terms of uh, the president establishing a legacy, that legacy is established already. It's just a matter of consolidating. Since 2015, you have seen that one election has been better than the other, simply because the president has insisted on being a Democrat. What did we used to see in this country? The party in government won all elections, whether federal or state or legislative or local government, they won all elections. That has not been the situation since 2015 because the president will refuse to tamper with the process. So the legacy is already built. It's just a matter of consolidating it. It will not affect that legacy in one way or the other. And Mr. Adishino, you also know that due to the electoral system that we have, we have had a situation where voter apathy has consistently and continually declined. So one wonders then how strong the legacy is if voter apathy continues to decline. Voter apathy continues to increase. It's not peculiar to Nigeria. It's not peculiar to Nigeria. I think it was Chile that, uh, that held elections recently, and voter party was a big issue. There was another country that held election. Voter party was a big issue. It's, uh, it's an issue generally in different parts of the world. So it will not be something peculiar to Nigeria. And if there's voter party, it is not, you can't source that to the office of the president. It's a general issue that needs to be addressed 
by the political parties, by maybe our national orientation agency, every agency that can ginger and spur the people must be involved in ensuring that voter apathy gets redressed. Well, a number of people felt that one of the ways to address voter apathy is to entrench direct participation. We've seen the abuse of how in direct primaries have been um, handled in, in most political parties. And oftentimes, um, I, I'm sure that you, it would seem that this um, bill was also a battle of sorts. We cannot hide, um, ignore that fact. It was a battle of sorts between the governors and the legislators uh, who seem to have held the short end of the stick for a very long time. Would you say that by this decision, the president has taken the side of the governors? No, I, I'll say the president has taken the side of democracy. He has taken the side of democracy. It's not, it, uh, it, it, he is not in, interested in taking sides in the tussle, as it were, between governors and the legislators. The president has taken the side of democracy, and he has explained it copiously why he would not side. It was anti-democratic. It had security implications. It has legal implications. And all those reasons. I think those reasons are quite genuine. It's interesting that the president has all of this uh, to say about the process. But, you know, a number of people believe that when he was going to be the presidential candidate of the APC, there was a reason why the party opted for direct primaries when he was to emerge. How come it, is it then that all of a sudden, you know, the entrenchment of direct primaries as the freest way to throw up a candidate is now anti-democratic? He, he said it that it would be anti-democratic to foist it on all political parties. And he emphasized that let parties do as they wish, let them do what they think is in their best interest. So if APC used direct primaries in 2019, that was the choice of the party. But then should it be foisted on other political parties? The answer is no. I think the position of the president now, which is let parties pick whatever suits them, whatever is fine by them, is the most democratic. Mm. Now you say that you, you say surely this is not the end. Mm. Uh, but how it's going to end, <laughs> we are not certain. Because yeah. what we see now is that in the Senate, this has not gone down well. This has not been received well. They know that they have the powers to override the president's veto. Um, what will happen if that's the decision they decide to take at the end of the day? Well, there are provisions, checks and balances in the system. The National Assembly can come up with bills, and if the president withholds assent, that is not the end of it. There can still be dialogue, there can still be procedures, part of it is collecting signatures. It will, be, it will be lawful, it will be legal. But then, because majority of those lawmakers are also members of the APC, there is also room for consultation, there is room for dialogue between them and the executive. So, all the cards are on the table. Shouldn't that consultation have happened before the it, president? It did. It did. You, you will recall that uh, the Senate president visited, the Speaker of the House of Representatives visited. That, like the president said in the letter, he engaged in consultations with stakeholders. The, Indeed. the consultations have just not ended. Well, well, that's what we're saying. So mm -hmm. assuming, I mean, if we take it for granted that indeed the president did consult. We saw them in the, uh, at the president's, uh, at the villa a few times. Mm -hmm. um, we believe that it was, as a, it was over this particular bill. We also saw the governors as well visiting the villa a few times uh, to also raise their reservations about this bill. So it was seen that the president was being lobbied uh, from all angles. <coughs> Um, not, not the governors, to the best of my recollection. Oh, the yes, governors, we, saw, we saw a few governors, governors. Well, coming we on individual. A, yes, we saw a few governors to, go to, to the raise, as well. To raise issues that concern their state. The governors as a body, I don't recall, met with the president on this matter 
of Electoral Act. Perhaps not as a body, yeah. but as individuals, we saw the governors in the villa a few times. And the governors the, will uh, always come the to the assumptions, villa. The yeah. assumptions, yes. I mean, we cannot rule out yeah. the, the fact that we don't know, we're not privy to all the details of their meeting, but we cannot rule out. If, if we're not privy to the details of the meeting of, the, of members of National Assembly and the president, uh, we're not privy to the meetings of the president with the governors as well. We cannot rule out the fact that he must have had conversations with regards uh, to this bill, given how strongly they feel about it. I mean, the only people who have come out so far to commend the president are the governors um, on, on this decision. So uh, if the National Assembly decides that they do not need the president's signature anymore, that they, they're going to go the full hog and pass the bill as they have the powers to, what will that, how will that resound with the executive arm of government? Well, what I would like to say is whether the governors met the president as a body or not, governors are stakeholders in this issue. And if the president consulted widely, he would consult with the governors. So they didn't have to come as a body. He could always speak with them individually. And I'm sure he spoke with a good number of them. Now, if uh, the National Assembly decides to override the president's uh, non-assent to the bill, it will be part of our laws. But then, don't forget that majority of these lawmakers belong to the governing party, the APC. So it's not going to just be something done um, with a sledgehammer. There will be further consultations. And at the end of those consultations, I'm sure good sense will prevail on both sides and something acceptable to the larger majority will come out. Well, we'll certainly wait to see what will happen um, in the coming days. You, you've heard Mr. Dishino say that this is not the end of it, uh, that there, he believes that there will be further consultation because um, majority of members in the National Assembly are members of the APC. But we wait to see how that eventually pans out uh, in the National Assembly and also in the executive arm of government. But we have to thank you so much thank for you. coming on Sunrise Daily this morning. Mr. Femi Adishino, a special advisor to the president on media and publicity. Thank, thank you. you once again. My